Hey there, welcome back to Big Al Books. Today I'm here to do part two of what I'm calling my catch up wrap up, where I talk about all the books that I've been reading in the past three and a half months while I haven't been filming videos on YouTube. So I'm sorry to hit you with two giant wrap ups in a row. I know that they're not everyone's favorite style of video, but I just want to get this all finished before the end of the year. And also, I feel like I can't put these books back away on my shelf until I've talked about them, and I'm tired of just having this giant stack of finished books haunting me beside my bedside. So in today's video we're going to be talking about the books that I read in November. It was a pretty great reading month for me. I've got around 20 something books to talk about and we've got some novellas, some novels, and of course some non-fiction. So we're gonna go about things in that order. So starting off with novellas. Now it was kind of hilarious. At the start of the month I had this crazy scheme in my mind that I was going to try and read 30 novellas throughout the month of November, I was going to try to hit a novella every day because I was going through my shelves and I realized I had so many unread novellas. And then on the first day of the month, I dutifully started my first novella and that was Suddenly the Minotaur by Marie-Hélène Potra, who is a French-Canadian Québécois author, and I absolutely hated this. So it really threw me off track for my novellas in November plan because I just did not enjoy this and I was like, you know what, I'm not going to ruin a whole month of my reading life reading things that I don't care about, so I totally scrap that plan and then I only ended up reading two more novellas after this one so that scheme completely derailed. I'll have to save that for another time. This novella is about the aftermath of a sexual assault that happens in an apartment in Montreal and it's told in two halves where you hear from both people involved in the crime and the first half is through the perspective of the assaulter and oh my gosh it was just one of the most unpleasant things that I've read about because he is just a pretty unapologetic rapist. He really loves what he does. He thinks about it a lot. And it was just so uncomfortable being in that headspace. I understand that sometimes it can be thought provoking to read about violent and unsavory kind of people to learn more about the human condition and why they are so terrible to other people. But I felt like this book was completely lacking that kind of insight that I needed. It was just really uncomfortable and unpleasant to read about and I was in a really bad mood after that. Fortunately, however, I had a much better experience with the other two novellas that I ended up picking up in November. One of these was was Double Indemnity by James M. Cain. I'd previously read The Postman Always Rings twice a few months ago and absolutely loved that one. And I loved Double Indemnity as well. In fact, I'm not sure which one I liked more because I feel like they're both perfect at what they set out to do. They are just these tense noir stories of betrayal and murder and deception. And they're both very similar as well. You know, they're about these guys that kind of wander into the scene and they are attracted to these married women and then very quickly into the stories they plan on how to kill the husband of the married woman and things go brutally wrong in both stories so it's just a lot of fun to follow along the plot and I felt like Double Indemnity had a good few twists and turns along the way so even though it's short at around 100 pages it is a really fun thrilling read that you don't want to put down until you finish. And then after that I read Margaret the First by Danielle Dutton. This one was really making the rounds on booktube I feel like a few years ago and I'm glad that I finally got around to it because it was quite enjoyable. I also felt like this was a good choice for nonfiction November because even though this is a fictionalized account of Margaret the First's life it is based on a real historical figure who is kind of a cool badass lady from history. She was just really marching to the beat of her own drum. She dressed however the hell she wanted to and she wrote fiction and nonfiction and strange stories at a time when women weren't really encouraged to do those sorts of things. So it was a lot of fun learning about this figure and I feel like this book was really well constructed in giving us these detailed and descriptive moments from her life. Like it really immersed you into the scene and even though it's a pretty slim novella you still feel like you really really understand Margaret and her time period and what happened in her life. So I think that it was really successful and it was quite a delightful read. Moving on to our novels section of the video, I have two books that were kind of spillover from October for me. These were creepy reads that I wanted to read around Halloween but I just didn't finish by the end of the month. One of these was The Graveyard Book by Neil Gaiman. I always try to experience Neil Gaiman stories on audio because I think that that is just the preferable way to go. And if you're cheap like me and you don't like paying for audiobooks or you don't have an Audible account, then you're kind of at the mercy of your public library system as to when you're 
going to get your holds available to you. So I was lucky enough to get my copy of the Graveyard book um, right around Halloween, but there just wasn't enough time to finish it before the end of the month, so this did spill over into November, and it was a delightful reading experience, as always. I highly recommend Neil Gaiman on audio. Charming as hell. This is one that's kind of, I think, more of a book aimed at younger readers. It's a bit of a spin-off of The Jungle Book, except it's called The Graveyard Book, and it is about a living boy who is raised in a graveyard by ghosts. So he's kind of someone who's in between these two worlds. This made for a compelling coming-of-age tale because as Bod grows up, he has a hard time reconciling these two parts of his identity because for him, in many ways, the graveyard is home. It's everything that he knows. His family are the ghosts. His pastimes involve getting into these different adventures around the graveyard. But as he grows up, he starts experiencing more of the outside world and building relationships with human beings. And you can really see the tension that this creates in him as he continues to grow. So this was just a wonderful read. Highly recommend if you're a Gaiman fan. And then the other kind of creepy read that I had was Goth by the Japanese writer Otsuichi. I didn't know anything about this book when I picked it up in the store. It was a total cover and title buy for me. But essentially this is a collection of interconnected short stories revolving around these two teenage friends. They're misfits by choice. They're very strange people who are obsessed with all the dark things of life. They're into death and murder and violence. But oddly enough these two happen to live in this town that seems to magnetically attract serial killers and these two teenagers just continue to get involved in these violent crimes that keep occurring. I thought that this was just such a great collection. Like each of these stories were deeply disturbing. So it hit the mark on that end. And these two teenagers were such compelling characters because they were just so bizarre and they had this weird relationship with one another. Totally check this one out if you're looking for something that is dark, creepy, and unusual. I know for myself that I definitely want to look into some more Japanese horror after reading this one because I thought this was great. Moving on, I have two novels that I read for teaching related purposes, so I won't spend too much time talking about them. Uh, but one of them was Everything I Never Told You by Celeste Ng, and this is like a dysfunctional family drama about a teenage girl who ends up going missing and they find her dead body. And it's kind of about the aftermath of that event, how that impacts her family members, but it also gives you a lot of context for what was going on in this family beforehand so that you understand why whatever happened to this girl happened. I will say that it was a really fast and engaging read. Like I burned through this thing in like two days because the chapters just went by really quickly. So I can tell that Celeste Ng is a very artful storyteller. What I didn't love as much about this book is that I felt like a lot of members of the family were kind of overdone. I would have liked a lot more subtlety with the character development because I felt like with the parents in particular, they each had this one specific thing that they were kind of trying to force on their child. So the mother was just like, you have to go into science, you have to have your own career. And the father was like, you have to be popular and make friends. And both of those parents were so obsessed with what they wanted from the kid, which is like fair enough. I know that that happens with parents, but I would have loved some more subtlety with how the parents were portrayed so that it wasn't so obvious that they were pushing their kid in this kind of way. So overall, this one was a bit of a mixed bag for me because even though it was compulsively readable and there were some heartbreaking moments in here, overall, I thought that it could have used a lot more nuance and the reader making some connections instead of having the author really spell everything out for us. And the other book that I read for school was The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime by Mark Haddon. This is a bit of a controversial book now because when it came out it was marketed as being a book about a teenage boy who has Asperger's syndrome. I think in the past few years this author has been trying to move away from having a label attached to the main character. We're not supposed to see him as someone representing what it's like to be on the autism spectrum but rather he's a unique individual with his own way of of understanding the world around him, which I think really shines through this narrative perspective. And that was my favorite part about this book, was understanding how our main character's mind works. On one hand, Christopher is very logical. He loves 
patterns, he loves numbers, he loves math, he loves when things just make sense. He's very observant, he's very perceptive, he notices a bunch of things at one time, but he has a bit more of a difficult time understanding people, their intentions, their emotions, and how to connect with them. And he is in a bit of a dysfunctional family situation. His parents had a rough time with their marriage, and Christopher has to figure out what's happening in his family and how to move forward with that. While I really enjoyed exploring the characters and the relationships that they formed with each other, I had a bit of a harder time picking up on the plot with this book, and I would put this one down for weeks at a time and not really think about returning back to it. So while this wasn't a perfect read for me, it was pretty thought-provoking and I'm glad that I checked it out and my students who are reading this one have been making some pretty interesting observations. So I'm glad that I chose this one as a book to use in one of my courses. And then next up I have one novel that I really liked and one that I really did not. So the one that I did not like is a bit controversial, so let's just get this one out of the way. And that is a book that I tried to read for my 20th century reading challenge, one of the books that I'm supposed to read from the 1910s, and that is Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man by James Joyce. And I know that James Joyce has a lot of fans out there, and I am sorry to be out here voicing my disappointment with this book, but I really, really actively did not like this book. You know, usually when I read a classic or like a famous modern classic, I feel like I've benefited in some way. And even if I don't like the book, I can usually understand why it's so important and why it's still read today. But I didn't get that with this book. I'm <laughs> just like, why, why do people like this? It was so dull for me. I just felt like it was one of the most dry reading experiences. So on some level, I can kind of understand that like Stephen Dedalus is this like heroic figure because, you know, he has all of these identities that are trying to be thrust upon him, like being Irish and being Catholic. And he wants to reject all of that and to just be an individual and to be an artist. So like, I get that that's important, but there's just so much boring stuff leading up to that realization like this was a tough one for me so I'm sorry Joyce fans honestly I I haven't had good luck with this author before I've had to read some of his stuff while I was in university didn't like him then I tried to read Dubliners a few years ago and could not make it through that collection and it makes me worried because I know that someday I'm gonna have to try to tackle Ulysses but just nothing has worked so far with Joyce and this one was no exception on a more positive note another book that I really really enjoyed was one called The Dishwasher by Stéphane Leroux. He's another Quebecois author. This was translated from the French by Pablo Strauss. I also have a signed copy that I bought at my local bookstore. This was one that I picked up because it was the bookseller's recommendation and he pitched it as a cross between Kitchen Confidential by Anthony Bourdain and The Gambler by Dostoevsky, which I thought sounded like a fabulous combination and it ended up being pretty spot on. So like the title suggests, this is about a man who takes up a dishwashing job. He's a graphic design student, but he has a gambling addiction and he's gotten into a lot of trouble. He owes a lot of money. He's screwing up in school and he just needs a job to keep him going. However, um, you find out pretty soon that even though dishwashers are kind of like the lowest paid employees working in a restaurant, they're some of the hardest working people out there. Like it's such a physically intensive job and this book describes it in so much detail. This book honestly gave me so much stress and anxiety while I was reading it because you'd have to get through these dinner shifts and something catastrophically would go wrong every night and there was always this situation and then he would go out after work with his buddies from the restaurant and they'd party together and and then you'd worry about what trouble that was going to lead to and how that would set him off with his gambling. So really this book was just stressful on all fronts. But what I feel like made this book so worthwhile is that you just were so immersed in the setting and the characters felt real. This is one of the rare times where I feel like I can close my eyes and just like vividly picture what the characters look like, what they sounded like, who they were as people. So it was such great descriptive writing. It's a really fast paced story because it is stressful. It just keeps you turning the pages. Um, but this was quite an enjoyable read. While I was reading The Dishwasher, I was strongly reminded of Sweet Bitter by Stephanie Dandler because they are both these kind of like inside looks at the restaurant industry. So I decided to pick this one up on audio. I read the physical edition of this a few years ago and I didn't really like it the first time around 
but I really could not stand it the second time around. So this was a DNF for me. And I think the dishwasher works so much better because it's kind of this like gritty and grungy version of like what happens in the back of the kitchen where a sweet bitter tries to cover like the difficult and embarrassing aspects of the job while also getting a little caught up in like the glamour of the New York experience. And this book, what really drove me crazy about it were the characters and the way that they speak because they just don't speak like natural human beings beings. They're so obviously fictional constructions that are like trying to be cool and sophisticated and the main character in here is just so awkward that you don't really understand why anyone would try to befriend her. So I could not do it. I had to DNF the audiobook. So if you're looking for a good inside take on the restaurant experience, I would much recommend The Dishwasher over Sweet Bitter. Before we move into the nonfiction section of this video, I just wanted to quickly mention that I have been binging my way through the Sandman graphic novel series by Neil Gaiman. I finished the first three issues of the series in November, and I've been steadily trying to work my way through the rest of the series throughout December so I can finish by the end of the year and it's been going great so far. So I actually read the first issue of this series, Preludes and Nocturnes, about a year and a half ago, and I really enjoyed it. But I didn't continue on with the series because I think the first issue is such a satisfying, self-contained narrative. You know, it's really this quest story where the Sandman, who's kind of this like mystical being, has been imprisoned by a human being for many years and he has to escape the prison, find his tools, and like gain his power back. So this one's a really like self-contained, satisfying narrative. As the series continues in volume two, you can see that the story really spills out in many different directions, which has been really fun to follow along. So what I really enjoyed about volume two is you start to get a sense of the scope of this series. There is much more freedom and you're introduced to what's going on in this world. There's also a section of this book called The Serial Convention, which if you've read this, you know how messed up that was. That really rattled me. <laughs> and then volume three is more of a collection of short stories. This involves four stories stories where Sandman is kind of stepping back from being the central character. He plays a role in these stories, but really we're introduced to new people and new settings. And I was kind of skeptical about this one. I thought like the short story idea, it was kind of just going to be a bit of a throwaway, but actually it's one of my favorite issues in the series. They're just such solid stories. And I love seeing what Gaiman is able to do with the form of the short story through this graphic style. So really satisfying narratives. And really I've loved my introduction to the Sandman series. These first three volumes were awesome and we will talk more about the series once I finish it by the end of the year, hopefully. Next up I'm going to talk about Fierce Femmes and Notorious Liars, A Dangerous Trans Girl's Confabulous Memoir by Kai Cheng Tom. And I feel like this book is going to serve as a nice bridge between fiction and non-fiction because though this is clearly a made-up story, there are tons of magical realism elements and the narrator is a self-professed liar However, I think that this book has been based on some autobiographical moments that the author has experienced. It is very much about the trans experience and finding your place and moving to a city and finding friends and all of that kind of thing. So I think that there are some like real moments at the heart of this, but it is just told through this kind of fabulous fiction style. So this was a really cool read in a lot of ways. I really like how this book challenges the reader's expectations for what a transgender memoir can be. I think a lot of memoirs kind of focus on some of the difficulties of being trans, you know, the feelings of confusion or what it's like to come out to a family who maybe doesn't accept you or dealing with hostility from society. And though she does experience violence in her community, what she decides to do is start this like badass girl gang with her friends where they go and hunt down predators themselves. So it is very much of an empowering narrative, although this book also critically examines the cost of being violent and engaging in that kind of behavior. So it was a fascinating story and like I was really rooting for this book. I'm glad that it exists, but what kept me from really liking it is that it just felt pretty undeveloped because it's only 188 pages and I felt like it was like almost a surface level kind of read. 
where the story was kind of fun and wild and had all these weird twists and stuff but I just felt like I didn't get to know the characters on a deeper level. So I just wish that the author had spent more time developing these characters and these situations and conflict in more depth. I think that would have made for a much more satisfying novel. Also while the writing style is really quirky and imaginative it could also be very clunky and very awkward at times, particularly the dialogue sections really had some cringy moments where I was rolling my eyes. So while I'm so glad that this book exists and I hope that it finds its right audience, it was kind of a rough read for me and it just felt a little unfinished. So glad that I checked it out. I just wish that it could have been developed a little bit further. So to finish things off, I'm going to talk about the eight works of nonfiction that I read throughout this month. I decided to go from least favorite to favorite for this list. So the worst piece of nonfiction that I picked up this month was one called Waterloo, You Never Knew, Life on the Margins by Joanna Rickard Hall. This is honestly such a specific and like local book that I won't spend too long talking about it because like unless you live in Waterloo, Ontario, you really aren't going to care about this one. And I picked this one up because I was like researching online where the haunted place Places are that I live near and this one came up so I thought it was maybe gonna be kind of creepy and informative about local history but it was sadly very dull like a lot of the stories in this collection seemed like they were gonna be promising and interesting and they just weren't. I was hoping that this collection was gonna make me feel more excited about the place that I live but instead it kind of brought me down because I was like oh man I do live in a boring part of the world don't I? <laughs> so this one um, was not great. And then next up I read Horror Stories by Liz Fair. I picked this one up because I'm familiar with Liz Fair as a musician. I really like her debut album Exile in Guyville and what she's kind of known for on that album is being like real explicit with her lyrics and just kind of being like tough and speaking some truths about the female experience. <laughs> so I was hoping that her memoir would do a similar thing here. What I liked about it is that it's told in essays and I always think that that's much more interesting than trying to drag a reader through your entire life story. It's better to just pick and choose some moments that you want to explore in some more depth. So I appreciate how she told her story. I didn't think that this was the most remarkable collection of essays. Like definitely would not have checked it out if I didn't know who Liz Fair was. However, it's not like terrible celebrity garbage. Like you can tell she put a lot of work into it. It's pretty well crafted. But just some of the stories in here, I wasn't the most interested in and already it's been a few weeks since I read it and there's not a lot that's like really stayed with me as being very memorable about this collection. So while I enjoyed to get to know Liz Fair on a bit of a deeper level, I can't say that this was a particularly memorable collection nor did it really inspire me to go and like listen to her music and go check out the albums that I haven't heard yet. It was just kind of, it was just kind of fine. And then also I have another musician memoir kind of book and that is Year of the Monkey by Patti Smith. I love Patti Smith as a human being. I will say that this is probably my least favorite out of her memoir type books that she's done simply because it seems to be like the most unfocused of the three. At first I was pretty intrigued with this story because Patti Smith was engaging in this conversation with the sign out front of her hotel. So I thought it had this cool like Wonderland vibe where she's talking to these inanimate objects. There was also kind of this weird mystery where she's trying to figure out why candy wrappers are appearing on beaches around her. So I kind of liked the first half. The second half unraveled a little bit for me. It just felt like it was a little bit unfocused and Smith was getting into like the Trump election which is not something that I'm usually very interested in reading about. So it did lose me a bit. However, I'm just quite happy to spend time in Patti Smith's headspace. So even when it didn't feel very connected or inspired, I just like hearing about her day-to-day -day life as she goes from cafe to cafe. <laughs> so um, not my favorite of her works, but I'm still glad that I checked it out. I always enjoy spending time in her company. Next up I have another memoir and that is Sounds Like Titanic by Jessica Hindman. And this is about a girl who comes from Appalachia and she wants to be a classical musician. She plays violin and she goes to music school and like realizes instantly that she is not talented enough to ever make it as a classical musician. But then she ends up getting this gig with this orchestra, but it's kind of a sham orchestra. So she gets paid to 
bring her violin to gigs, and pretend to play while she lip syncs to a CD recording behind her. So what I liked about this coming of age memoir is that she's tackling some big themes through her own personal story, like the experience of being a young woman trying to start her professional life and not being taken seriously um, as someone who comes from a different cultural and class background living in New York City. Also she's wondering about why Americans sometimes seem to prefer things that are clearly fake rather than the real authentic experience. So there are definitely some interesting themes in here and this is also a very readable memoir. It's told in a very well-constructed way that will keep you turning the pages and wanting to read about this like strange experience that she's having and the very weird composer that she's working with. There were a few things about this memoir that I had trouble connecting with. Sometimes I felt like the narrator was really trying to like hammer home a point or trying to like make more out of her experience than she needed to. Um, to have it be this like important statement whereas I would have maybe just preferred her telling like these weird funny stories without really trying to connect it all in this larger significance but still um, overall this was a really well-crafted memoir of a pretty bizarre story so I enjoyed it. Next up I have a book called A Semicolon by Cecilia Watson, The Past, Present, and Future of a Misunderstood Mark. I absolutely loved telling all my students that I was reading a full-sized book about semicolons. I think that they have now lost all respect for me and think that I'm just the hugest nerd in the world, but this was a really fun read. And I know what you're thinking, like it's about a piece of punctuation, how much fun can that be? But really she uses this specific mark to look at the broader context of punctuation and why it was developed and how it's really changed over the years. So it's kind of about how like punctuation used to be more of an artistic decision that revolved around pauses in your writing. And then as science became valued in school curriculums, English teachers realized that grammar should be a little bit more scientific and should follow rules. So we kind of had to invent these rules about grammar and syntax and punctuation. So this book is kind of challenging what grammar is and why we should follow these rules. So I thought this book was really fun and gave me a lot to think about as an English teacher. It also does this cool thing um, in the second half where she gives you a lot of examples from literature about how the semicolon was used in a really beautiful or purposeful kind of way. However, where this book lost me was in one of the final chapters. The author just kind of went off against David Foster Wallace for some reason and it just became a bit spiteful in a way that I didn't feel was necessary. You know, I am someone who does enjoy David Foster Wallace. So I just felt like everything leading up to this had been pretty delightful in this book and then it just ended up with this attack that I was kind of like, why did we need to go there, you know? I understand having those feelings, but like, do you need to bring them into your book about the semicolon? I don't know. So that kind of brought me down as I was finishing this book. But overall, I quite enjoyed this and I'd highly recommend it if you too are also a huge nerd and you want to learn more about punctuation. I definitely have been noticing semicolons around me more and how they're being used. So it has made me a more curious and engaged reader and really I love when nonfiction is able to spark that kind of sense of wonder in the reader. So. This was a great read. Next up I have a chunky nonfiction read and that was The Victorians by A.N. Wilson. I started this one back in October during Victober. I thought it would be cool to learn more about the actual Victorian era since I enjoy fiction from that era so much and this was a great text to do that. You know there are very few single volume works that try to take on the entire span of the Victorian era. So I think A.N. Wilson did a very successful job of trying to cover a lot of history in not a lot of space. What I will say about this book is that if you're completely new to the subject, I don't think he does the most clear job of providing context. So sometimes as a reader he will casually mention something that is kind of important and you'll need to go look it up on your own to understand what he's talking about. So it's probably not the best like basic introduction guide. And what I liked the most about this book is that it's not just some kind of definition of like the main events that happened and the key players, but rather he's trying to take you into these small specific moments. So you do get introduced to a lot of these like random personalities and I thought that that was a nice personal touch to introduce us to these kind of lesser known figures and to give us more dramatic and entertaining stories. So even though it took me a ton of time to work my way through this one, I feel like it definitely paid off in the end. I've learned a lot more about this era and its key players and some of the events that were happening at the time 
and how that connects to who we are today in the present era. So how the Victorians shaped a lot of what we know in the modern world. So this was a pretty fun read and I quite appreciated how the author tried to bring history to life in a bit more of an engaging fashion. And then lastly, my top two nonfiction reads of the month are actually both memoirs. And memoir is usually the genre that I seem to struggle with the most, but I thought that these two were both very artfully done. Uh, the first one of these is In the Dream House by Carmen Maria Machado. I feel like this book is getting a lot of buzz any time that I see someone talking about this book, it seems to be very favorable. So this is a memoir about an abusive queer relationship. So the author is kind of trying to contextualize this experience and she's investigating why there aren't that many narratives that are exploring the darker sides of some queer relationships. But it's also just like deeply personal, like this is an emotional read, it's really tough to read about the author's experience. But she doesn't just follow the pattern for a conventional story about an abusive relationship. Instead, she kind of tells the story in more fragmented pieces. So you can see that it's made up of a lot of little anecdotes. They're all titled with some different variation on Dreamhouse in some different kind of genre or style. So it was a really innovative mix of genre and that way she didn't have to tell the story in this kind of linear scene-by-scene -scene fashion but you'd be jumping around a lot uh, which made for a really intense reading experience because you didn't know what you'd be jumping from. Uh, there was a particular section in here that was told like a choose-your-own-adventure style novel and that was one of my favorite parts of this book. So this was a really powerful read, not only just to hear the author's story, but to also see what can be done with the format of memoirs and how they can be told in these really experimental and exciting kind of ways. And then lastly, my favorite nonfiction read of the month was definitely more of a conventional memoir and it's the top of my list just because it was so dang delightful and it just made me so happy while I was reading it. And that was The Raven Master, My Life with the Ravens at the Tower of London by Christopher Skyfe. Look at this man. He's so freaking cute. So this book... Basically what it says on the title, this is a guy who works at the Tower of London and he's in charge of taking care of the ravens who live there. Essentially there's been some kind of myth that spread throughout history that there always needs to be a raven living at the Tower of London or the whole kingdom will fall. So it's become like this total job, like someone who has to make sure that there are always some healthy and happy ravens. And Christopher just seems like he is so passionate about what he does. He loves the ravens so much, you can tell he cares about them, and they bring so much joy to him, which then brought so much joy to me as a reader. So I just, I loved everything about this book, every minute. Like, Chris has such a warm and welcoming voice, like he just drew me in right away. He's so funny when he talks about the birds. Like, I loved learning more about ravens. <laughs> My boyfriend Taylor can attest that while I was reading this book, I was like watching all of these videos on YouTube, like trying to learn the difference between ravens and crows. <laughs> so I just had so much fun with the subject matter. Each of the ravens that he works with has like their own distinct personality and I loved learning about all of them. So this was just such a winner for me. Like it really brought me joy. I can't explain even why it just it worked so well. So if you are also a raven lover and you like delightful things, you need to check this one out. It was so cool. I honestly think that I could sit here and talk about how much I loved The Raven Master like for hours on end. So I'm gonna cut myself off right here. Thanks so much for watching my November wrap up. I promise that my next video will be something a little bit more exciting than just a wrap up. I am working on my year end best of lists. It's always a very fun but a very stressful process. So until I get back to you with those videos, take care and thanks for watching. I will see you again later.